So you're, you're being moved, literally. So look at uh, this poem by Hopkins, which is, it's an interesting one to start with because it's very much about energy at that basic level, the life force which fights against despair, which fights against what pulls you into nothingness, emptiness, death. This is what, he's at a threshold here, and this is what's being summoned. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair. Not feast on thee. Not untwist, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me. Or, most weary cry, I can no more. I can. Can something hope, wish they come, not choose not to be? But ah, but O oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me, thy ring world right foot wrong? Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, O oh, in terms of tempest, me heat there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lies sheer and clear. Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since seems I kissed the rod, hand rather, my heart low, lands strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year of now done darkness, I, wretch, lay wrestling with God. My God. Mary talked about poems that keep working every time, and I think if it were just an idea, the idea would grow stale. But the rhythm works on you each time. Each time you have to take it through you, and you feel it all over again. That's what I find with these poems I've chosen. So, look at that, not starts it out. Now, if he were to be more logical in the syntax, he'd start, oh, not. But Hawkins is famous for moving syntax around because he doesn't want to follow the rhythm of syntax. He wants to follow the rhythm of emotion and of the body. And he wants a surge of energy there because to pierce through the despair that's pressing his life into nothing, there needs that surge of energy. And so he summons, and he requires you to summon it when you read this. Not. That's the way it has to begin. And then there's a whole sequence of knots, one after the other, that establish a rhythm. The not, the O, oh, ah, oh, say that, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And you find the back of your throat opening in a way that you do when you're going to vomit. <laughs> he has something poisonous he has to vomit, and that's the despair that's laid hold of him, right? And you feel it. There's a rhythm of wretching in the first few lines here, where the knot, it's about pure energy coming in, in anger and rebellion, forcing the despair out, because that's a feast that he's indulged in, that he's reached the point where suddenly he sees, my God, it's carrion, and he's disgusted. Do you want to eat carrion? It's, it makes you gag, right? And that's what he's doing. He's heaving. And we, when we have to start a poem out of silence and go, not, nah, there's a heaving that's enacted inside of us in that moment. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair. Not, he's hungry. Not. There's that rhythm of heaving and wrenching. And if, in addition to that, you feel the sound of the teeth, which is at the other end when you spit that thing out, I'll not carry a com comfort, despair, not feast on me, not and twist, last, stranced. So 
very physically, there's the energy being moved in you as you read this, and you're made to feel what is described in the content. You're made to feel it. That's where the poem has to begin. He's at that threshold where there's that sudden rebellion, that sudden perspective that that, that this thing he's been indulging in has to be spit out. After that, one can build. And this is what you see happening. And this is, there's so much to talk about, but let me just draw your attention to the, a sequence of cans here. Can. Not unto his slack they may be these last strands of man in me or most weary cry, I can no more. I can. Can something. He's starting to build, right? He's rejected despair. Now he can start to hope. He's crossed that threshold. Look at the can. Pay attention, for example, to the pitch. He's, and this is fun to do when, whenever you read anything. To really, because people talk accents and unaccented, but it's not just those two. It's not duh and dumb, duh and dumb. It's a whole range of sound, right? And if you listen to the cans here, I can no more. I can. Can something. Can. Can you hear that? That's the sound of reaching, of yearning, of starting to hope, and it's being built up. And that's the rhythm that you speak as you read this. Now, the whole poem is chock full of accented syllables, like right ring, right ring world, right foot pop, which are hard to say and slow you down. And that's the energy that he is now insisting on, a life's energy. He says, you'll not unto a slack they may be, these last strands of man. You can think of the strands of man being these lines of poetry. And he doesn't want them to go slack, sink into that lethargy of depression, of despair. So he's putting the energy in, and that's what you have to summon as you speak these lines. And at the same time, this struggle is very much an internal one, and it's a struggle against himself, right? <coughs> I, I mean, most struggles are. And, and, and so the syllables that are stressed and that have weight are also banging up against each other, and as you read this, you feel that difficulty instead of side of yourself, which you would evoke the feeling of internal struggle that you would have at any point in time. Um, so, <coughs> point, I mean, if I'm talking about how there's lots of such stress levels in Rome, he does that in other poems where he's describing his ecstasy. So it's not like you can say, when you see this, then this is the feeling. Every time it's always in context, and this is what makes it so fun to always look at poems, because every time what the poet does with the rhythm uh, depending on what's being described, you'll interpret it in a different way.